Well, this is going to be sort of a, a video inspired by the recent defeat of a proposed uh, amendment to a gun control bill, basically to expand background checks to all purpose uh, purchases. This is an amendment to a Senate bill that uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, who's probably the single most intractable enemy of gun rights uh, in the federal government, certainly in the Senate. There are several others who are obviously, you know, big enemies, but for her, it seems to be a big priority. There are people like Chuck Schumer who will support any gun control that they ever see, but on the other hand, they're not spending a lot of their time drafting legislation for it, whereas Senator Feinstein, this is like her, her deal, and I, I think that there's some kind of pathology where she is afraid of her constituents and seeks to have them be as physically um, unarmed as possible. And uh, I think she even admitted that you know, this is legislation that she always has waiting to go and then she just will introduce it whenever there's a mass killing you know whenever that happens she tries to spring this stuff even though it very often has no applicability to the incident in question um, now fortunately this amendment was uh, defeated and within congress the senate is the one place where it would be the most likely to pass that's where there's a majority of democrats um, the senators tend to have, since they have six-year terms, they are slightly more insulated from potential voter backlash than, say, members of the House are who have to face re-election every two years. Um, and yet, uh, because of procedural, procedural, uh, let's see, uh, maneuvering made by some Republicans, basically they made it so that they had to get over 60 votes to add the amendment and uh, they were not able to do this. Uh, there were a few Republicans who supported it, people like John McCain, Lindsey Graham, who are just, you know, merging with the, the worst elements of every party and every, and every issue that they talk about. Uh, even if it had passed, people like Rand Paul and a few other senators said they would filibuster it, although the filibuster would be unlikely to actually prevent uh, implementation of a policy they can draw attention and um, you know, Paul has proven that he's willing to actually do it. However, it was unnecessary in this case. The amendment for uh, universal background checks was uh, was defeated. Also, I don't think this is quite as major a deal as some of the gun proponents are making because such an amendment would have no chance in the House, which is majority Republican and fairly radicalized Republican. Uh, I think that it's safe to say it would not make it past... Um, you know, a, a Feinstein amendment to a gun bill would probably not have any chance in the House. But nonetheless, I'm glad that it got defeated in the Senate. But what I want to talk about here is the use of polling and the political discourse about this topic. Um, the only critique I've seen, the only defense of this um, amendment that I've seen offered is basically that it's quote-unquote popular. Uh, and you know when Obama came out and gave his speech when he chided um, Republicans for voting no, and essentially he blamed this all on the NRA without naming them. Um, it was on the basis through his argumentation that uh, this is popular with 90 percent of the American people, and so it's just pure special interests that oppose this. Um, to out on a side here. There is a very common theme uh, that runs through the pro-gun control movement to depict the gun rights movement and its political manifestation uh, as somehow a fringe um, special interest group that has, you know, that has nothing to do with the American people. And actually the Brady campaign kind of ha has these little illustrations that make it look like there's, a, there's an evil triangle where the gun lobby pays Republicans to vote for pro-gun legislation, and the, the pro-gun legislation uh, somehow uh, increases the sale of firearms, which uh, um, en engorges the gun industry with money, you know, companies like Remington and Ruger and Smith and & Wesson and, and, and whatever other companies, and then those companies then tr um, take some of those profits and give it to the NRA, and so there's kind of this vicious feedback loop of, of death, you know, that's that's greased with the blood of innocent children, you know, which makes this all possible. And they, they don't care that they're killing people because they're making money and this is how they're making money. And this is just a complete 
uh, misrepresentation of reality. The NRA is indeed a very powerful organization. It's one of the most powerful lobbies in Washington, I'd say, after APAC. Uh, it might be the most powerful, maybe maybe the NEA, maybe there's a few others that are also pretty powerful, and I guess it's pretty hard to measure power, but the NRA is definitely powerful. But if it's powerful, it's powerful because it's popular. It's powerful because it has millions of members, and people should realize when you hear a number of how many people are members of the R I R or NRA, not IRA, NRA, and I believe it's usually placed at something like 2-3 million, those are only current members. Uh, there are lots of people who have been members of the NRA at one point in their lives and who aren't anymore. And it's not usually, in fact, rarely is it because they had some kind of ideological falling out and they are no longer a supporter of gun rights. If anything, they stopped supporting the NRA because they thought it was too, too uh, moderate when it comes to gun rights. And indeed, as far as gun rights organizations go, the NRA is very moderate. Pretty much all the other gun rights organizations uh, are considerably more radical when it comes to protecting gun liberties. The next largest gun rights organization is the Gun Owners of America, and they favor the abolition of all gun laws. They don't think there should be background checks for anybody at any time. They don't think there should be restrictions on fully automatic, on you know what kind of capacity. Pretty much the only thing that they actually would support uh, that exists is maybe a ban for felons to own guns, but even then I think that they have some qualifications. Um, and that's the second largest gun rights organization. Um, the NRA is popular and the NRA is powerful because millions of people give them money. There are millions of people who are willing to donate money to them because those millions of people value their gun rights enough to spend an awful lot of money. I mean, the standard donation that the NRA asks for is a hundred dollars and there's like lots of people who are willing to donate that much and lots of people who donate less and some who donate more. Now, furthermore, the the graphic, the conspiracy theory that while well, the the gun companies are funding the NRA, that's I don't know if that's true or not. But even if it is true, where are the gun companies getting all their money? And the answer is, other than when they have government contracts, which is sad to say many of them do, it's because there's a huge demand for their products because their products are popular. There are tens of millions of Americans who are active firearms owners and they dump a lot of money into firearms both the guns directly and then the ancillary materials the ammo the equipment the safety stuff uh the cleaning stuff uh everything that comes with it and if you're a gun owner you know there's a lot that comes with owning a gun it's not like you just buy a gun and you're all set you always end up buying a whole bunch of other stuff too and the fact that they are willing to voluntarily make these uh these payments is an indication that they value them and so if these gun companies are hugely successful and have lots of money, it's only because to the extent that they're not getting government contracts, that is, and I, I think it's safe to say these companies would still flourish even if they had no government contracts, although exactly which ones would be how big would probably change. Uh, the, the, the gun industry itself is a reflection of the value that the population at large places on it. Uh, so the depiction of the NRA as this kind of this fringe element uh, is uh, completely disingenuous. Uh, it represents the views of t probably tens of millions of gun owners, uh, and as such, I don't think it should be dismissed as just uh, you know this this tie. And, but the NRA is unfortunately somewhat synonymous with the quote unquote gun lobby. Although, as I said, there are other organizations that are vehemently pro Second Amendment that are powerful. Uh, that get things done at the grassroots. There are organizations in every state uh, and within their states they can often be very powerful. Uh, uh, states that don't have concealed carry for instance typically have organizations dedicated to its implementation and that's actually rare now because those organizations have generally su su succeeded and concealed carry has become not only legal but relatively easy in most states. Um, it's kind of a, a sign of their success, but the objection remains well, this is still popular and the, the, the most recent poll that was kind of bandied about was 90 percent of Americans and if you look at there have been several other polls um, that basically show more or less similar not always 90 but 70 80 percent of Americans who indicate to a question oh well I think there should be more background checks uh, but I think that it's pretty clear that 
poll data is not persuasive evidence. In fact, it's debatable whether it should be even be considered evidence at all. Um, when I was in school, when I was in seventh grade, we had to have we had a, a, a section of the year where we did quote unquote debates, and part of the debate was uh, that you had to present evidence quote unquote. Uh, um, substantiating whatever you were trying to debate, you know, if you're debating for or against something. Of course, in the course, you would be debating, there'd be a topic and you'd be debating one side and another team would be debating the other side. And it was explicit that poll data that we collected ourselves uh, was considered evidence. And so there wasn't any, and, and since, well, it's just far easier to collect poll da data than it is to collect other evidence actual rigor, rigorous empirical evidence or, or rigorous logical evidence um, and you know as a when I was doing this I remember thinking oh I'm gonna you know make this poll and you know and I'm gonna try and get the highest percentage I possibly can and uh, you, you make the questions accordingly you know uh, and would, during the week where everybody was doing the debates, though, it became pretty obvious that everybody had the majority of people in whatever polls they said supporting whatever it was their position was. So even the opponents would have, you know, 80, 90 percent in favor of whatever it was. And it became clear to me, as it should be clear to most people, that um, a pollster has the potential to get whatever answer they want based on the types of questions they ask, the types, types of people they bother to ask, and how they aggregate that data. Now, uh, that's not to say necessarily that every pollster is, you know, deliberately, consciously trying to be biased, but that potential is there. And, you know, you just look every poll that I saw in this class, everyone had 80, 90 percent, the pros and the cons. And it's just uh, when we're talking about legislation, you know, the legislation that is going to get passed, the amendment itself is a very long amendment that has lots of details to it. At no point do people say, read this entire amendment and then say whether you favor it or not. I didn't see any polls, and um, where I looked, I looked down at some aggregation sites that had the questions that they asked. None of the questions, you know, included, here's the text of the amendment, do you favor it? Um, and yet, when they look at the answers, they then extrapolate that, oh, well, this person answered yes, hence they support this legislation. I think this is uh, fallacious. Um, indeed, when more specific elements of the text are kind of revealed in a question, the percentage of people in favor tends to go down. Um, you know, one, I didn't see any that were this blatant, but, you know, you could just say, do you think that uh, criminals should be allowed to have guns? And, of course, most people are going to say no. And then they could say, well, this legislation purports to prevent that, and so the fact that 99% of people said no means 99% of people support this legislation. Uh, now I didn't see any that were that that deliberately disingenuous, but most of them asked, "Should background checks be expanded?" But when they ask more specific questions, like, "Do you think that uh, family members should be forced to do a background check when they exchange firearms?" So not even a sale, but a gift. Uh, the the percentage of people went all the way down to about fifty percent instead of ninety or eighty percent. Well, the thing is, the legislation would do that. The le legislation would require background checks between private uh, exchanges of guns, even between family members. Now, when most people answer that question, if they just ask, do you want to expand background checks, that doesn't occur to them to even consider that that would be implied, or that that is implied by the, that's actually explicit in the in the legislation. It doesn't occur to them to, to think about that, so they just say, yeah, I favor it. Where if you ask them, do you favor background checks between family members, they more of them indeed nearly half would say no um, so I think you know polls and I always heard this was uh, attributed to Mark Twain but then I've also heard it attributed to Besman, uh, Benjamin um, Disraeli uh, the British Prime Minister uh, that you know there's three kinds of lies and I, I don't know which one is true I always I had heard Mark Twain said this for my whole life or not my whole life, more than a decade, and then just recently someone posted on Facebook that Benjamin Disraeli said, said it. But it's that there's three kinds of lies. There's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's polls. You can get any answer you want from a poll. They're extremely inexact. They're not a reflection of reality. They're not even a reflection of people's true preferences. You know, you can ask a question, um, you know, if you were attacked by an assailant, 
would you fight back? And you could get a result that says, you know, 65, 75% of the people say yes. But answering a poll is different than actually having to face an assailant. And we don't know how those people would actually react if that situation were to, to happen in real life. You know, it's kind of like looking at somebody playing Call of Duty and concluding, well, this person's willing to jump out of second story windows and they'll uh, stand up, uh, you know, exposed to direct fire from a whole bunch of highly trained assassins. Uh, no, that's not realistic. They're playing a game. It's not real life, and the way they act in that is not going to necessarily be the same as they'd act in real life. Likewise, someone calls you up on the phone and asks you a question on any topic. It doesn't have to be about gun control. Your response is not necessarily going to reflect how you actually would respond in real life. The other problem here is there is um, a very politically incorrect but obvious problem with ignorance. Uh, voters tend to be ignorant on topics. And I remember on, I had a Facebook exchange with somebody who was ad admitted, look, most people don't know. I mean, he was like, look, 90% of the people want this, you know, so it's anti-democratic to be against it. But then, you know, admitted that most people ha don't have any idea what the current laws are or what the, this um, proposed amendment would even be. So why exactly is their opinion worthwhile? You know, if, if you have a thousand fools and they vote, you know, just the fact that 90% 90, 90 of the fools believe in something, uh, make it a good idea? I don't see how. Um, you know, when it comes to background checks, despite the fact that there are millions of people who do use guns, even among gun owners, this stuff is, for some reason, kind of just taken for granted. Um, you know, whenever you hear somebody reference the quote-unquote gun show loophole, uh, that is basically demonstrating that they don't really understand what the current situation is. There is no exception in the gun laws for gun shows. There's no law that says, oh, if you have a gun show, you don't have to do background checks. What there is, is the federal government, and this is not true necessarily in all the states, the federal government says if you buy a gun from a federally licensed dealer, you have to do perform a NICS background check. You call the FBI and you have to verify the identity of the person and see if they are a felon, if they're a prohibited purchaser. That's any licensed dealer. So if you go to a gun show and there are licensed dealers there, and typically there are, you know, some gun shows are huge affairs with, you know, hundreds of vendors and many, many thousands of attendees, maybe even tens of, the largest ones have tens or hundreds of thousands of attendees, um, all the way down to maybe just a couple vendors, maybe just a couple dozen people, and all the ones that I've been to, they've had licensed dealers there, and they've had private sellers there. Now, here's what people consider the loophole. The law says if you're not a licensed dealer, if you're just a private citizen who occasionally sells guns and they have a rubric for how they decide, it has to be a certain amount of your income. If you make 99% of your income from your job or from some other business and just every once in a while you sell a gun, then it's not your business. If you make all your living off of selling guns, then the federal government is likely going to consider you somebody who needs to have an FFL. That's stupid and arbitrary, but that's just the way they look at it. If you don't have an FFL, then it's not considered necessary to do a background check. This is why if you are a parent and you want to give your son or your daughter a gun, you don't have to do a background check. If you want to sell one of your guns on the side to one of your buddies or somebody else, you can do that. And you don't have to get a background check. And at a gun show, very often there are private sellers. Now, I think probably some of those private sellers, if you were to really you know, do an audit of their financial transactions, might find that many of them do an awful lot of business buying and selling guns and maybe would technically have to, you know, should have federal firearms licenses. And actually, there are a lot of people who get federal firearms licenses, not because they want to go into business, but just because they want to make it easier for them to buy guns. If you buy a gun online, this is something people don't understand. They can't ship you, you can't order a gun in the catalog and have it shipped to your house. I wish that was true, but you can't. Um, if you order a gun online, they will ship it to a licensed dealer that will allow it, and not all dealers will allow it, and if they do allow it, they'll probably want to charge a fee. And then you have to go to the dealer, and you have to get a background check at the dealer. Now, if you have an FFL, if you have a fire, federal firearms license, then you don't need to go through that because you already have the license. And I know I've, there are lots of stories of people who they don't want to go into business, they don't want to sell guns, they just want to buy them, and it makes it simpler for them to get an FFL to do that. Um, so there is no gun show loophole, but, you know, the, now... And different states have different rules. So, like in my state, um, 
if you go to a gun show and you want to buy an assault rifle from a so-called assault rep weapon, a semi-automatic power, a high-powered rifle, um, and it's a private seller, there's no paperwork, it's just cash or whatever you agree to, to exchange, and that's it. However, if you wanted to buy a handgun in the state that I live in, you have to get a permit to purchase the handgun, which the state has to give you. They can't say, oh, we don't think you deserve it. Uh, as long as you're not a felon, they have to give it to you. Um, in other states, you don't need that requirement. You can just buy a handgun. In other states, you need to get more paperwork to get any kind of rifle. You know, there are there are states that have uh, laws that are as restrictive or comparably restrictive to anything that you have, say, in Europe. Uh, you know, licensing for everything, background checks for everything. Uh, what's the word? Uh, <sighs> discretionary issue where basically the sheriff or the city police basically can you know deny you access to a firearm for whatever reason. Uh, and it's totally political where they do. I know like in California, if you want to get a concealed carry license, it's up to the sheriffs. And many of the rural counties, the sheriffs are, you know, they'll give them to anybody. But if you go to Orange County or some of the more urban counties, they won't give them to anybody but Tom Cruise and Diane Feinstein. And ironically, she's someone who had at the time, I don't know if this is still true, but when she was mayor of San Francisco, she had a permit to carry a gun. No one else could get one, but she said she needed one. And, you know, I guess, you know, she either wasn't aware that was hypocrisy or she didn't care that people might recognize it as such. I don't know, probably both. Um, but m most people don't know anything about the laws and they don't know anything about guns. And yet, you know, they're, the answer they give on a phone survey is really compelling evidence about what the law ought to be. I just don't see how that makes any sense. Um, you know, th th these laws, you know, these particular, this particular amendment, even though Feinstein's had it for a long time, uh, you know, she's introducing it in response to the Sandy Hook uh, massacre, so-called, at, at the elementary school. But this law, if it was to be implemented, you know, say if the NRA had no power and it got passed, uh, would not have prevented that event from happening because uh, the guns that were used were obtained legally. They would have easily passed any background check and then they were stolen. So, and that is actually statistically where most guns used in crime come from. They come from theft. They're stolen from people. And so the background check on the legal buyer doesn't help you at all when it comes to their use in actual crime. The other problem is a lot of these people don't have prior records. Um, some of these other mass shooters they don't have prior criminal records that would make them fail a background check so they could pass the background check, they could legally buy the gun, and then they could go on a rampage. So these these checks, uh, you know, logically it doesn't make any sense that they would reduce crime, prevent tragedies, do anything other than offer a template for confiscation and, uh, well, registration and then confiscation. And, you know, someone was posting the other day, the Nix is very clearly not just a way to prevent felons from getting guns because if that was it they would check your identity and then they'd say okay you are or are not a felon and so you can have the gun or not have the gun based on that but then they ask for other details like the serial number of the gun well why does that matter if it's not a registration and it's not going to be used for registration why is it significant that they would need to know the make and model and even the serial number of the firearm if you're not a felon then uh you know the the, the system has d done has, has performed its function of checking whether you're a felon or not, verify that you're not, and you should be able to walk out of there. But no, the, the the gun dealer has to submit what exactly gun you're purchasing, like literally what exact gun you're purchasing. Um, so uh, I'm one of those people who believes the NYX is, was designed to be a first step to a registration, and then just miracle of miracles, you know, that was established, what, 1994, and it still has not become a full registration. It's still not because you don't have to indicate when you transfer it. So it's quite plausible, you know, they could come to your door and say, we know that you bought these guns, and you could quite plausibly say, I sold them legally years ago, and I don't know who I sold them to. And the number of people who are going to shrug and say that in the event of some kind of registration or confiscation is, you know, numbers in the millions or tens of millions, and the logistics needed to deal with that uh, are beyond the capacity of the government, at least right now, and probably ever. Um, and that's why I think that the NICS was intended to be... Look, there was a big wave of gun control in the early 90s, and I think a lot of people thought, okay, um, 
you know, this is the first step in a couple of years, we'll make this more. And, uh, you know, if I had been politically savvy back then, I would have been predicting this and I would have said, and I would have been wrong, but I would have thought this is what's going to happen. But at, what actually happened is there was a very large political backlash. Unlike in other countries, especially the UK, um, where when the forces of gun control um, became much more politically assertive, uh, in those countries, the gun rights movements that existed, and they were unfortunately very small, basically put their tail between their legs, and they said, we don't want to sound like we're in insensitive, we don't want to sound like we're mean, we don't want to sound like we don't care about crime, so we're not going to um, rhetorically or even uh, um, politically object very strenuously to the uh, onslaught of the gun control lobby, of the government, really with the pretext of these, you know, joke organizations like Brady Campaign or, you know, Million Mom March. In the United States, on the other hand, there was a very, uh, a coalescence and development of a very powerful background. The NRA has been around forever, but it became much more powerful and much more reactionary against you know, potential future gun restrictions uh, in response to, uh, you know, th this perceived wave of gun control. And, of course, the kind of the the... The apogee of this was someone like Al Gore, who was explicitly, you know, he didn't even give the, I believe in hunters, you know, it wasn't like Bill Clinton who could who could say two things out of each side of his mouth at the same time and be persuasive with both of them. He was just like, you know, we need gun control, gun control, and uh, you know, his defeat in 2000. And I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna be like this is all great because Bush got elected because Bush is not really a friend of the Second Amendment either. But the the his defeat and then the subsequent defeat of, of more gun control at the federal level and then the repeal of so much gun control at the state level, which is a big thing people aren't aware of, is uh, just huge amounts of state level gun control has been repealed all through the 90s into the 2000s and up to the present. Um, that just the character of how that issue is approached, the pro-gun rights, the more libertarian side of the argument has become extremely aggressive and effective and the other side of the argument has become increasingly defensive. Um, now, Obama in his second term, and this is significant that it was his second term and not his first, has become more more direct in terms of gun control. He's been the most, you know, direct pro-gun control president that's actually been in office. You know, you have someone like Al Gore or Dianne Feinstein or other people, but they have never actually been president. And like I said, Clinton. Clinton could speak out of both sides of his mouth. Uh, I, I consider Clinton the smartest president we've had in a really, really long time. Um, and the best liar I think I've ever seen. Better than Obama, better than, than any of the others. But on the other hand, I don't think he was principled at all. I think he was totally pragmatic in the way he approached politics. And when he didn't think gun control was a winning issue, then he wasn't really going to go for it anymore. He didn't, um, to his credit. Um, but, you know, what's interesting, so Obama has kind of a, approached this much more directly. You know, in his first term, people were afraid that he would, and then he waited till he got reelected. And, and, and what is, to me, obviously, you know, sh shrewd politicking. And it's ironic, you know, all these pro-gun control people are like, oh, you know, we don't want one more family to die, one more tragedy. Well, he let lots of tra tragedies happen in his first term, and he didn't do anything. You know, the Aurora shooting, he didn't do anything. Uh, the well, Virginia Tech was 2007, but all the mass shootings that happened when his first term, he did nothing. And it wasn't until the first mass shooting at the start of his second term or after he'd been elected to his second term that all of a sudden, then he can do it as an issue. You know, what does that say if you believe the rhetoric of, of you know, not one more life? That he was willing to let as many children be massacred as possible until he gets reelected and, and does, it can't hurt him politically any longer. Um, and, you know, it's almost as bad as his um, crocodile tears for children getting killed when he's off, you know, uh, shooting Hellfire missiles into weddings and schools and, you know, whatever else, just towns killing children. And then he gets all teary-eyed because, because some area that he has banned people from having guns gets massacred in. Um, but th there's been a resistance against gun control and it's actually if anything it's become getting stronger the, the and I, I don't like polls but you know they, they have shown a decline for 
um, the acceptance of additional gun control laws uh, for about 15 years now, at least 10. Um, and I don't think polls are really, I mean, logically, there's no, ev there's no scientific evidence that more background checks lower crime. There are states that do require background checks on all gun purchases, and they don't have lower crime than states that don't. They don't have fewer mass shootings. Connecticut had some of the most draconian anti-gun laws in the country before Sandy Hook ever happened. It certainly does now. Um, and yet, you know, you look at why, why are these mass shootings, why don't they happen in Wyoming or Utah, Montana, Arizona, Alaska? You know, these are the states with, you know, the weakest gun laws by far. And you don't hear about all the mass shootings happening in those areas. It's always in, you know, Illinois, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, New York. You know, places, or Los Angeles, Illinois is probably the biggest one. I mean, the highest murder rate is in Chicago, and Chicago has probably the strictest gun laws of anywhere in the entire country other than D.C., which also has perhaps the second or third highest murder rate. Um, you know, the, the there's no empirical evidence to support the um, conclusion of these polls that these are actually a good idea. Um there's no evidence that they would reduce crime. There's every bit of evidence that they could be used as a jumping off point for a more comprehensive uh, background system. They also raise the cost. If I have to get a federal license dealer to sign off on a deal, that raises the cost at the very least in time, but also probably in money. And that also would reduce the volume, by, although only slightly, of guns used in society. This is kind of like... Um, one of the ancillary, I think, goals of a lot of this is the idea is if you can regulate it enough, people will lose interest in even doing it. I know in Australia, they basically instituted a system where you had to get um, cards. They call it, you have to be licensed dealer, uh, licensed to even buy a gun, to use a gun. You have these things called cards. I think the cards basically record everything you do. So if you want to go to the gun range, you put it on your card, you have to get it signed off on them. But it's, it's a huge hassle. And what happens is the number of people who legally own those cards collapses and this has happened in Massachusetts and Connecticut and a couple other states that basically have adopted similar systems and that is very likely the intent is to shrink the base of people who are, are using guns by making it using regulations to make it very expensive in terms of time and effort and money sometimes um, you know if if the number of people who uh, were um, who liked guns who used guns could be reduced by 90% the power of the gun lobby to resist additional gun control would be that much more reduced. And so I think that is um, that is one of the, the hopes, but we're not anywhere close to that. I mean, and that's that's why I also think that compromise is such a bad idea because, you know, you were going to compromise and all that does is weak, it compromises your position, weakens your position for the next compromise, which weakens your position even more. Uh, I think Larry Pratt, and I believe he's quoting somebody else, that says, you know, was, well, the way a socialist looks at it, what's theirs is set in stone, but what's yours is negotiable. Uh, well, no, I don't think it should be negotiable. And uh, I still think that we should be on the uh, assault, so to speak, in terms of gun rights. We should be not putting our tail between our legs and thinking, uh, you know, this doesn't sound, this sounds insensitive when it's not insensitive to advocate that victimization not be allowed, that the government not be allowed to uh, force victimization on people, um, that they should, you know, that their promises to protect us are obviously hollow, and they're not actually promises. I mean, they, they're, they're, they're lies. They lie and say that they will, but then when you read the fine print, they actually aren't obligated to, and in, in effect, they don't. Um, Every time these mass attacks are stopped, it's always the in intended victims who do it, and the only way, and they the best way for them to do that is with their own guns, barring that to just use themselves or you know, whatever all their means are available to them. The police never stop them; they're just incentivized against doing it. It's practically difficult, uh, and so that that promise that you know we don't need them because the government will do it is just it's a it's a hollow promise. Uh, and I'm not willing to stake my life on it. No one else should either. So uh, there's that. And then again, polls are just so ridiculous. Uh, they don't convey any any information about the issue. They convey information about the population and what it thinks. 
but what it thinks is not necessarily reality. I think, I think most people can understand. I mean, there's a lot of democracy is such a religion, and the idea of voting is such a religious kind of phenomenon that people have this tendency to give it deference when our sensory organs, you know, our ability to reason, and I think all people have the ability to reason to some degree, lots of people choose not to. You look at it and you're like, okay, obviously a majoritarian electoral decision making is not necessarily the best. You know, the, idea, the, the conclusions that are reached via that medium are often disastrous, and so even if they're not always disastrous, one has to say, well, just because democracy says so doesn't necessarily make it so. Um, and just because a majority of people answer this or that on a poll is hardly evidence that this or that is actually a good policy. So uh, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, most gun rights uh, organizations that I saw were satisfied with the defeat of this bill. If it can't get passed in the Senate, it won't ever get passed in the House. Uh, even if it could get passed in the House, it wouldn't matter because it's not passed in the Senate. Um, Diane Feinstein, again, demonstrates her uh, sheer hypocrisy. Um, she is one of the most ghoulish, disgusting legislatures. Like I said, she's up there with Lindsey Graham, John McCain, and Chuck Schumer, and a couple others who, um, you know, I actually, I, I have a hard time not just looking at them and just seeing pure evil. It's, she almost actually even looks like Emperor Palpatine in a lot of ways. It's wrinkly skin and crackly voice, but all right, that's it.